this is our heart's desire, Lord, that when we preach to our soul, come, soul, join my lips. You will answer, and the soul will join, and we will not be hypocrites anymore. Forbid that Jesus' indictment Your lips praise me, but your heart is far from me. That's what David feared so badly. Come on, soul. Don't let that happen to me. Join my lips. So, God, I plead with you that hypocrites would be healed in this service that souls would be awakened, hearts would be awakened. We wouldn't be a mouthy people, but a soul people, a heart people, a pure and authentic and genuine and whole people. Oh, Lord, there are so many things to engage our souls. Come and awaken them, I pray, through Christ. Amen. This is message number four in the six-part series on the Psalms. And the title is, of the series is Thinking and Feeling with God. And there's a sequence. The first message was from Psalm 1, and it was an overview to stress that the Psalms are God's word and the Psalms are poems and therefore we are to immerse ourselves in them so that they become instruction for our minds and songs for our heart. The second message was a focus on Psalm 42 and how to deal with discouragement and spiritual depression well. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in such turmoil within me? Hope in God. And the third message was from uh, Psalm 51 and how to deal with regret and remorse and sense of failure and guilt for, because of the sin that we have committed. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Heal the bones that you have crushed. And today we focus on what may be the most densely packed gospel psalm in in the Psalter, Psalm 103, and we shift from overview and from discouragement and from regret to thanksgiving and praise. And if you wonder where we're going, so you can decide whether it's worth it to come back, We're going to the hardest issue next week, namely what is often called the imprecatory psalms. Damn them, O God! I hate them with perfect hatred. Can you pray that? That's in the psalms. And we will wrestle with, is that an appropriate response ever? On the lips of a human being. And then the last one will be, declare his glory among the nations, Psalm 96. The one next week is Psalm 69. So that's where we're going. Today, if you start the Lord's Day at 6, it's Father's Day. In America and in about 50 countries around the world. Therefore, I'm starting at verse 13. 
As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Now, when this verse says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, it does not mean the Lord learns how to do fathering by watching good human fathers. It doesn't mean that God wonders whether to show compassion to his children, takes note that good fathers seem to do that, and then decides, that's the way I'll treat my children. That's not what this verse implies. No. What the verse means and implies is when it says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. It means when you see a good father, you see a picture of God. Put it another way. God designed human fatherhood to be a portrayal of his own fatherhood. God had a son before he created the universe. God was God the Father Almighty before he was God the creator of human fathers. Therefore, he knew exactly what fatherhood meant forever, and he created fathers to make that a little more plain. That's what the analogy is meant to call to mind in our, he- in our heads. So, fathers, this is our calling. We learn to be fathers by looking at God's fatherhood. We learn how to treat our children by watching the way God treats his children. And children grow up to learn about the fatherhood of God by watching their fathers. And it should be so. It is, men, a huge calling. When David says... As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He means God created fatherhood in his own image. Good fathering points to God. It points children to God. It points wives to God. It points neighbors to God. It points colleagues to God. That's why there are fathers in the world, everywhere. That's what we are for, to reveal the fatherhood of God. How are you doing? Now, he's aware that when he, he says, God knows our frame, verse 14, God knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As soon as he says that, his mind is moving toward the fact that fathers won't always be around. They're like grass. They're like flowers that bloom in the spring and the wind passes over them and they're gone. And so his mind and his words turn to the shortness of human life, the never beginning, never ending length of God's life, 
and how it relates to our children. So let's read that, starting at verse 15. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. And then he contrasts God with us. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. He hasn't forgot this fatherhood issue. He's dealing with what about the children? If the dads pass away like a flower, what about the children and the children's children? Pick it up again. His love is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness, to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. So fathers need to realize they won't always be around, and their children won't always be around. So verse 17 refers to the children's children, and they won't always be around. And the question that a father, therefore, must ask if he's like God and loves like Jesus is, how can my children benefit forever from the love of God? Or, using the other phrase, how can my children experience the righteousness of God, referred to here, such that it vindicates, sustains, carries, and preserves them forever instead of condemning them, which the righteousness of God will do for millions. And the answer to that question, how can my children experience the love of God forever, not for a season with the sun rising on them and them then perishing in hell, but forever. And how, how can the righteousness of God be for them their stay in their rock rather than their sentence of condemnation? How, how can that be? The ans- there are three answers right here in these verses that we just read. And every father who cares about their children coming to experience the love of God forever and experiencing the righteousness of God as vindication rather than condemnation should pay close attention to what these three answers are. Verse 17, second half of the verse, they must fear Him. Verse 18, the first half of the verse, they must keep His covenant. Verse 18, the second half of the verse, they must do his commandments. So let's read it so you can see the flow. Verse 17, the steadfast love of the Lord, and I want my kids to live in this love forever. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and nobody else. And, secondly, his righteousness will be for them, the children's children, if to those who keep his covenant and do his commandments and nobody else. So, we need to ponder for a few minutes these three requirements that our children must meet in order to experience the love of God forever as love and the righteousness of God forever as vindication. What does it mean? Let's start with the middle one. What does it mean to keep covenant? For those who keep his covenant. A lot has changed since Jesus, the Messiah, came into the world, hasn't it? He stood at the last, perhaps he was sitting, (laughs) at the Last Supper, and he lifted up the cup, and you remember what he said. This cup 
that is shed for many, that is poured out for many, is the new covenant in my blood. This is the new covenant in my blood. That's Luke twenty two twenty. New covenant. So Jesus, the Messiah, long expected by David and the psalmists, has come. And covenant keeping with the living God is now clearly spelled out in the New Testament as to how it is to be done in view of the Messiah having come. And at the heart of the covenant, the new covenant that came with Jesus is his blood shedding. When the new covenant was promised in the Old Testament, right at the heart of it was, your sins will be forgiven. And so when he says, my blood is being poured out, he's simply saying, here it is, the final decisive sacrifice by which all sins are forgiven. If you're going to keep covenant with me, you will be born again through faith in me and thus united to me so that my blood counts for you and there will be no condemnation for you anymore. That's the new covenant. The other piece of the new covenant mentioned was he will pour out his Holy Spirit because now the new age is inaugurated and that Holy Spirit will massively work in those who are born again to keep them from the path of destruction and change their lives so that they obey the Lord. Not perfectly, just evidentially. It will be plain by the change that has been wrought. This person is a new covenant keeper. So at the center of these three requirements is keep covenant. We live on this side of the cross, therefore the only covenant I care about is Jesus inaugurated, blood-bought, righteousness-providing covenant. And the New Testament makes amply plain that covenant keeping here is the receiving of this Christ as my Savior, my Lord, my supremely valuable treasure. And if I receive him, I receive all that he has worked for me and all that he is for me. And what he has worked is a substitute death And what he has brought with him is his perfect righteousness. And therefore, if I welcome him and keep covenant by faith in him, his blood covers my sins. His righteousness clothes me so that I am acceptable to the Father. So then if you back up from there and ask, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Because that's stated as a requirement. The only people that will eternally experience the love of God as the love of God are people who fear the Lord. Is that a separate and distinct requirement over against keeping covenant with Christ by trusting his new covenant provisions? I don't think so. Here's what I think fearing God means today. I think fearing God means that God is, in your mind and heart, so powerful and so holy and so awesome that you would not dare to run away from him but only run to him. In other words, fearing God is not another requirement. It's the way you do covenant keeping. It's the way you receive Jesus. It's the way you come to Jesus. You come 
reverently. You come humbly. You come without any presumption that you deserve anything or he owes you anything. You come trembling or as we saw in Psalm 51, you come with a heart that is broken and contrite. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Tremble if you ever feel any inclination to leave this God. There is only destruction away from him. Oh, how we should fear to leave the Lord. Tremble in his presence that he would so graciously receive us, forgive all of our sins and make an everlasting future. So many people do not fear their carnal departures. They don't tremble. So, my answer to how these two requirements, the covenant-keeping one where you fly to Jesus for his blood and righteousness and hold fast to him as your only hope, and the first one fearing this is just the way you fly. And what about the third requirement? The only people for whom God will be their righteousness is those who are keeping his commandments. Sounds kind of funny to say it that way, doesn't it? Here's what I think that means. I believe that it means your faith in this Christ and you're flying to him desperate and fearful that you would turn to any other resource must be real. Can't play games. And the Bible is so amply plain that if you have come to him as savior, if you have come to him as king, if you have come to him as treasure, if you have flown to him with trembling that you could go any other where, any other place, it's going to change your life. Period. It's going to change your life. It cannot not change you if it's real. So We've been together long enough, although there are a lot of guests. You know I don't believe in Christian perfection. It ain't going to happen in this age. Not a single person will live a single day perfectly. Okay? Just get that away. However, you cannot make sense out of the Bible if you don't say, Obedience to the commandments as a trajectory of life, repenting of failures, confessing sins, and getting back on has got to happen. In other words, the central requirement, covenant keeping through faith in Jesus, has got to be real. And obedience is the Evidence that it's real. It's the sign that it's real. It's the mark that it's real. It's the fruit that says the tree's real. Dads, we would lay our lives down, wouldn't we, for that to happen in our children? Because if it doesn't happen, they will cease to experience the love of God when they die. And they will experience only wrath from then on. It's called hell. And they will cease to experience the righteousness of God as maintaining some kind of order and justice in the world. And they will experience the righteousness of God only as condemnation from the holy judge forever if our children do not experience covenant-keeping fearing God and the evidence of obedience. That's why we have families. That's why fathers exist, to do the impossible and to bring our children to that place. So here's my 
my only other question in the message. It's a, it's a psalm that tempts me to preach about 15 weeks on it. Just every benefit needs a sermon, right? But I preached too long last week, and I promised him I wouldn't preach too long this week. And so I'm going to just tell you one thing that this psalm clearly emphasizes and say this is what we need dads more than anything and then, and then give you uh, categories rather than specifics to think about. So here's, here's the answer. What does this psalm say is the one thing stressed above all others that fathers need to do to lead their children to the condition of blessedness I've just described? Ask it another way. What, what would be the one thing that would be the greatest blessing to your children and to your wives and to your church and to your colleagues and to your extended families and to your city and to your own soul? And the answer is, bless the Lord. There is no, no question what this psalm begins and ends with and wants to happen, right? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. This, this psalmist is lifting up whole-souled, whole-being blessing at the beginning and at the ending. It ends on, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So I'm going to argue and illustrate, fathers, that the most important thing we can do for our families, our children, our churches, our city, is to bless the Lord. So what does it mean? What does bless the Lord mean? What's happening when you do that? I think Bless the Lord in the Psalms is virtually synonymous almost with praise the Lord. Listen to the way they are paired in Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So at least they overlap. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And notice the word mouth. Clearly, David's mouth is at work, and he's eager for his soul to get to work. Okay? Come on, soul. Soul, bless the Lord. I'm blessing the Lord. Why don't you bless the Lord? But the mouth is very, very important. I, I think blessing the Lord means speaking well of the Lord's greatness and goodness. If you ask, force me to a definition, it would be speaking well, singing well, using your lips and your mouth to say appropriate things about his greatness and his goodness. And Jesus said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And therefore, as David begins to exercise his mouth, like we would do here in singing, his prayer is, bless the Lord, soul. Bless the Lord, heart. Don't make a hypocrite out of me. So when I say that a dad's greatest gift to his children would be that he blesses the Lord, I mean the way David wants it done. Hypocritical dads destroy children. Real dads who are blessing the Lord from the bottom of their feet to the top of their head with their mouths save children. 
So that's what I want to happen in our church and in my life. I, um, and this, believe me, this does not stop when your children are grown and gone. Not in a thousand years should you ever have that thought in your head. Bless the Lord. Verses 20 to 22. Bless the Lord, O you, his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. So one of the things you do when you bless the Lord is call others to bless with you. So fathers, I would dare to say that perhaps nothing you do for your children, nothing you do will be more effective in producing the fear of the Lord, covenant keeping and obedience to the commandments than if you bless the Lord continually in their presence. Oh, how rare this is. How rare this is in our homes. Fathers who openly and from the soul bless the Lord with their mouths are rare fathers. They should be normal, typical Christian fathers, and I fear they are rare. So dads, listen, don't, don't check out on me here. Don't go the fatalistic route of saying, Piper, come on, I'm not wired that way. End of listening. Please don't do that. Believe in the Holy Spirit. Believe in the power of God. At age 60, believe in the power of God. Not fatalism. Not you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can. No, you can't. God can. Believe in the Holy Spirit. Please don't leave me here. We've only got a few minutes left. Don't leave me here. I'm talking to you. I care about you. I care about your kids and the effects that your silence is having on them. And how many we lose. His dad was so stoical. I couldn't tell if he was a Christian. So let me just point you to the categories in the psalm, dads. The rest of you can listen in. Of what you should bless. So here's, here's what I want to happen. Lord, let this happen. This would be a miracle. I want dads to grow little by little or a lot tonight, today. I want dads to grow a lot in their willingness and readiness to, in the presence and the hearing of their children, bless the Lord. I'll give you three illustrations of how the psalm does it. Number one, let your children hear you bless the Lord for his sovereignty. Verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. So let your children at the dinner table or the breakfast table or over devotions in the morning or at night say things like, I bless you, Lord, that your kingdom rules over all. That, that's not hard. I bless you, Lord, that your kingdom rules over all people, over all governments, over all weather systems, over all animals, over all molecules, over all galaxies, I bless you, I praise you that your kingdom rules our family. Amen. Let's eat. <laughs> Wouldn't that be impressive to your children? Wouldn't something go down deep and stick like weather systems? What you talking about? Cedar Rapids? Yes. 
And a conversation happens and a a seven-year-old understands. You won't get any big theological argument from a five-year-old about the sovereignty of God. He'll take it. He'll live it. If God is merciful. So let, let your children hear you say, I bless you for your sovereignty over all things. Now, isn't it interesting that when he said that in verse 19, he didn't quit. (laughs) He knew that the way God exercises his sovereignty over all things is through angels and hosts of heavenly beings and works on the earth. And so he said, come on, angels, bless him with me, all you ministers who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Come on, heavenly hosts, join us at the breakfast table as you bless him for the great works that he does through you and come on works now that's really strange mountains and rivers and fields and beasts of the air and birds of no beasts where the beasts live (laughs) birds of the air and beasts of the field and the fish of the sea come on world bless the Lord now any ordinary kid I think would say how do they do that and then you're into it How does a rock, we sang about it. The rocks are going to praise you someday. If we don't, well, they're going to praise you even if we don't. Do. (laughs) Dads, let your children hear you bless the Lord for his sovereignty. That's the first category. Second category is let your children hear you bless the Lord for his justice and righteousness. This will mean a little more as your kids get older and they will be glad to hear you say it. Verse 6. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. So, at the breakfast table, any time during the day, I bless you, Lord, for your advocacy of the poor and the oppressed and those who are being treated so unjustly around the world. I bless you that though the wrong seems off so strong, you are the ruler yet. And justice will be done, if not in this age, in the age to come. You are just. And I bless you that for all the injustice in the world, you're not unjust. Let them hear you say this. In other words, don't just be a teacher. Yes, be a teacher. Bring your kids up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. But, oh, sing it. Praise it. Let them hear your heart and not just your brain. Because if you don't have their heart, you don't have them. And if you don't look like God has your heart, why should they give him their heart? Just go through the motions, devotion, motion. No, dads, come on. Let's let our children hear us bless the Lord for his righteousness and justice. That's category number two. And here's the last one. Let them, let your children hear you bless the Lord for his mercy and forgiveness. That's what really is driving this psalm. It's amazing. Let your children, and this will be the most powerful thing your children will ever hear coming out of your mouth because it will crush you to the ground. And they need to see that. My boys told me late, late in teenage years that I didn't communicate to them that I was a sinner. They thought, as a kid, I did it all right. What a failure. What a failure. So I'm trying to make it up. I'm a sinner. (laughs) 
So look at verse three. Bless the Lord who forgives all your iniquity. Look at verses 10 through 12. He doesn't deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Oh, fathers, this is my main exhortation, I think, the one thing to take away. Let your children hear you with a broken and contrite and very happy heart. Bless the Lord that your sins are forgiven. Let, it, let them see that this really moves you. You love mercy. You love forgiveness. Kids mainly, they're wired this way, they mainly absorb the do's and don'ts, right? They mainly absorb Christianity is don't do this and Christianity is do do that. It takes a phenomenal miracle for them to say, Christianity is my dad broken in heart that God forgives his sins and therefore he might forgive mine that dad doesn't know anything about. What, what a wonderful, wonderful gift to our children. So yes, teach the gospel and, and do the Sunday school thing. Go to these classes. Those of you who are meeting on Sunday morning, go to these classes and watch modeled for you. After the first service, watch modeled for you um, the way to do family life together. And let there be, dads, a blessing of God's sovereignty, a blessing of God's justice and righteousness, and a blessing especially He died for me. He loves me. He forgives all my failures as a dad. Let your children hear that. I'm talking out of experience. I think I'm talking out of the Bible. I raised four boys. They're all grown. They're all fathers. I sent them all Father's Day cards with checks for their children to be good fathers to their children. And I know the most powerful thing I ever did was knock on their door when I'd totally blown it and praise God that he forgives me and would they. So dads, I just don't buy it that you're not wired this way. You're not going to come to me and say, I'm just not wired that way, so don't expect me to bless the Lord for anything. I'm going to get in your face again and again and again and pray the Holy Spirit down on you so that whatever your personality is, you can grow a little bit and bless the Lord. The rest of you, singles, wives, children, this totally applies to you. And I hope you see it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, please, I'm asking for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Bethlehem, especially on dads. We all need it, but dads have been the target of this exhortation. Let our children hear us bless the Lord. We bless you for your sovereignty over all things. We bless you for your righteousness and justice. We bless you for your mercy and forgiveness and patience and kindness toward us in all our failures, shortcomings, sins, pride, rebellion, anger. Oh, how precious is the mercy of of God. We bless you for it. Work this in our church, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.